Are you ready for a new opportunity? I've been in marketing for 20 years and it's changed a lot, but it doesn't have to be complicated. I want to help you grow your business. The world is changing every day and you need marketing that works. Go to my website at scafarms.com and click the link, Grow My Business. If you need help with your online marketing, your website, developing email programs, or putting your own shows together, go to my website at scafarms.com and click the link, Grow My Business. Thanks for listening and enjoy this next episode. Get ready for this. Wow, I am blown away by the response I've been getting on Facebook. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Upstate's Farmer's Market Podcast. The following program is for adult audiences only. You are listening to... Hey y'all, thanks for having me on the Farmer's Market Podcast. Relax and enjoy. We are one of the few tea growing farms in the United States. Hi, this is Chris Thurman from BioA Farm. Hi, this is Kristen with Earth and Organic. Hi, this is Mark Jones from Cedar Falls Farm. Thanks for listening. And now your host... Great day, everybody. My name is Stefan, and you're listening to the Farmer's Market Podcast, the show that talks to farmers, homesteaders, beekeepers, craft makers, and much, much more right here in the upstate of South Carolina. We keep it fresh. We keep it local. Here we talk about all things Farmer's Market related. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, and become a supporter of SCAFarms.com. It's the home base for my farm online and the Farmer's Market podcast. Please share with all your friends on Facebook and other social channels and let me know if there's a local farmer that you would like to hear on the show. Now, today's guest, he is a big family man. He's an owner of a 48-acre farm just off of the banks of the Reedy River and has a mighty fine view. He loves his chickens and he's living out a dream of his. Welcome to the show, Mark Jones with Cedar Falls Farm. Well, thank you, Stefan. I appreciate you having me on your show today. Not a problem. We appreciate you being here. Now, you can find Mark and Cedar Falls Farm at cedarfallsfarm.com. Now, tell me, Mark, take us on a walk at Cedar Falls Farm and what's happening on the farm right now. Well, as you said, we have 48 acres nestled on the Reedy River. We're down in the Fort Shoals community on the Fountain Inn address. We're about probably 10 miles outside of the town of Fountain Inn. It's a, a nice rural area. And uh, we have maybe 28 acres open. It was a former horse farm that we've slowly been converting over to a, a working farm. Uh, we, we do produce. We have chickens. We have bees. We try to get honey when it's possible, but our focus is on the the lives of the bees first and then honey second. And uh, we we just enjoy the, the rural life and, you know, moved out of the city subdivision living some years ago to, to get back to the roots. Now, what did, what did you do prior to farming? Well, I still do that. I actually work with Michelin Tire here in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm a materials design guarantor. I've been with Michelin 28 years, and uh, I'm actually on the countdown now. At the end of the first quarter of next year, I'll be retiring and farming full-time. So I've been farming for the last three years in addition to my work at Michelin full-time. You've had a tough job at Michelin, and now you're taking on even a tougher job. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's tough doing both at the same time. But it's a, as you know, being a farmer as well, it's a labor of love. It's something you love to do. It gets into your blood. And there's something uh, primordial about providing food and providing good quality food to people. You know, we pasture raise our chickens. We didn't start out that way, but uh, we, we evolved to that. And it's uh, there's a little more loss with it with the predators because you can't protect them in, in enclosures all day long. But we're giving people high quality by doing that. And how many chickens now? How many chickens do you have? We're up close to 300 the last batch i ordered 100 chicks and they're about four weeks old now and i'll probably sell off half of those but we have to bring new chickens in periodically to help infuse you know as some get older and we lose some to predators we're trying to keep the egg laying going uh, but this time of year it starts to drop off we were getting about eight dozen a day and now with the shorter days and with molting taking place we're probably down to about four or five dozen a day. But we're we're trying to hold around 200 chickens at any given time. 
Oh, wow. Now, do you have a certain variety or, or, or a certain breed that you have on the farm, or do you have multiple ones? We have multiple. We have some focused varieties. Uh, a couple of favorites that we have are ISA Browns, which is a, it was developed in France probably about 30 years ago. They're very similar to Golden Comets. They lay about uh, maybe 300 to 320 eggs a, a year and large to extra large size. And then we go with Golden Comets. You get about 300 eggs a year out of those. We have some Bard Rock uh, Americana, which lay the colored eggs. You'll get blue-green looking eggs from them. And we have Australorps. And there's a, there's a small smattering of other breeds in there just different things we've we've done some rescue breeds i'd call it when people have not been able to take care of their flocks we'll we'll take them at the farm bring them in and isolate them for a week or two to make sure they're disease free and then we introduce them to the flocks and let them be able to roam the pastures during the day now i'm i'm very familiar with the the golden comments we we've had those as well we've also had the australorps actually I, the the australorps aren't laying anymore we've had them for about 3 or 4 years and um my wife just won't let me get rid of them she loves them so much um and and we i think <laughs> I, yeah i i'm trying i'm really trying but um the, we've had a lot of success with gold star are you familiar with that breed I'm not as familiar with that, no. They may be similar to, I think they're very similar to what you mentioned earlier that, that's related to the Golden Comet, but they were the great layers. Um, and, and I believe it was a farm out of Duncan that he was kind of kind of weaning out his, his flock, and we picked up a few from him, and my, they were prolific layers. I mean, they were two a day for a, a good straight while. I mean, they're the ones, they're the only ones producing. The Australorps aren't producing anymore. But So you've got a ton of chickens, and you're, you're selling. And we do pasture i mean i mean they are pasture uh chickens pasture hens but i think i read somewhere that you keep them out on the pasture for about 12 hours a day is that right it'll get typically about 12 to 14 hours a day and and stefan it it depends on the time of year like right now it's getting dark earlier so the chickens go back to roost so i have one pasture attached to the barn and i've converted two old horse stalls into coop and roosting area, you know, so they can go in and lay and they have a roosting area and feeders inside and water inside as well as outside. When they go in, I go down and close everything up, refill everything, take care of them. And uh, the upper pasture, it's uh, probably about an acre and a half or something like that. And they'll go into what was a run-in shed for horses. I, I drug it probably a hundred yards with my tractor out of the pasture uh, over to that pasture and we converted it into a coop and closed it and it's nice so uh, they get as much time exposure as there is daylight wow and at night you know we wow. have to close them up because we, we've got owls we have foxes raccoons opossums and uh, hawks there's there's any number of predators that we have to be on the lookout for and uh, for the chicken safety and and just Actually, for the well-being of the animals that we're entrusted to care for, we close them up at night to protect them. But they get a lot of outside time. We make certain of that. That that definitely makes sense. Now, did your your job at Michelin did it prepare you for this in any way? I'm trying to figure out where did Mark get the the <laughs> the idea to go. Hey, you know what? We should raise a bunch of chickens. So I could, I could yeah, Michelin. Your mindset and way of thinking at Michelin is very analytical. So you you have a process to doing things it's not haphazard you you get a lot of that from from time and experience working with with that great company but i can take you back to when i was a kid you know i can go back 50 years my dad was a southern baptist minister and we had small churches and uh, his first church was hillside baptist church in the hillside community in the lower part of greenville county not far from where we live now and we had chickens and we had chickens when I was a kid because a uh, Southern Baptist minister at a small church in the country didn't make a lot of money. So we had probably 30 or 40 chickens that provided eggs and meat. And we also, every year we raised a garden, we canned, we preserved, we froze. So growing up, this was part of my life was the farm part of it on a smaller scale, of course. But it was something that always rested in my mind, and, and it was something I wanted to get back to. And uh, once we started, when, when George Ann and I moved out from the suburbs back into the country, it's like, hey, let's uh, start out with a few chickens, and we can have our own fresh eggs. 
You know, we don't have to buy eggs, and uh, if we have any left over, we can sell those. And it wasn't long until I was having to buy eggs for us because we had a demand for eggs that I couldn't keep up with. <laughs> and, and it grew from, yeah, it grew from there. So it's, it's kind of a nice problem to have, you know, where people are wanting your product. And I've tried to grow to keep up with the demand. And it's, it's, it's enjoyable. So, yeah, there's a little bit of preparation in, in my day job. But there's also some, I'll say, nostalgia from when I was a kid and the way things were as a child. And people all over, I find, are going back to that, trying to get away from so many preservatives, trying to get away from packaged foods, and, and actually knowing where their food comes from. And when we sell direct from the farm and people come out, if I'm there at the farm, they want to take a tour. I'll, I'll put them on a the golf cart. Come on. I'll show you what we're doing, what's going on. You can hold a chicken. You can, you can feed chickens. You can tour the farm. I'll ride them up and show them the beehives, you know, ride down to the river. I get away from the farm part of it and just share so people can experience what we experience. So when, when did you get into the bees or were the bees just a part of it as well? Because I, I have a, a terrible bee story. Um, that will probably make a lot of people not want to do bees. Um, and I don't have bees on my farm, although I know they are hugely and massively beneficial to everything we're doing in the garden. But how did you get started with bees? So I, it's something that was in the back of my mind for a long time, and I really wanted to do this. And, and I just I put it off and put it off. And uh, you may recall about probably two and a half years ago, uh, Stu and Cedar Anderson in Australia, invented this new method of extracting honey, and it's called the flow hive. Now, amongst beekeepers now, you mentioned flow hive. There's a lot of naysayers. There's a lot of uh, disagreements in the beekeeping community. Now, all it does is offers a way of extracting directly from the hive into a jar. It still requires the same amount of upkeep, the same amount of care, and managing your bees. But it was an easy way for me to start into beekeeping we bought two of those. They were quite expensive. Actually, for one, for one hive, one flow hive at a time, $600, I could probably set up another three or four hives, good and proper, the, the Langstroth hives. Wow. So I got into beekeeping wow. through that. I did a lot of studying and preparation beforehand so I could do justice to the bees. And uh, it's, it's gone from there. But being analytical, analytical like I am, I couldn't just be happy with doing the flow hives. I bought two flow hives, and I said, well, I need to buy two Langstroth hives so I can do a head-to-head -head comparison. <laughs> right, right. And I didn't, you know, I didn't wait a year or two to do that. I had to do it that year, and we had packaged bees. I bought those installed, and, and we enjoyed it. And we didn't extract our first year. It was a bad year. The weather was terrible. There were droughts, and we ended up going into winter. We lost our bees. And I've learned a lot about disease prevention sense and how to treat your bees. And and uh, it, it's kind of growing on me. I've spent a lot of money <laughs> getting into this as I do with most things farming and don't recoup near as much as I spend yet. That day's coming. Right. But it's, uh, it's, it's a passion. You know, it's just a passion. But I've, I've learned I've learned some valuable lessons in beekeeping. It's not if you will be stung, it's when you will be stung, and it's how many times you will be stung. Because bees, in, in the beginning with bees, they're very, I'll say, docile when there's plenty of nectar and there's plenty of pollen, and you're feeding your bees and they're happy. And uh, you finally get to the point, it's like, I really don't need to put these gloves on. Hey, I can do without this veil and this jacket. And some beekeepers are able to do that all the time. They're quite crazy, in my opinion. But right. I thought, well, you know, we're walking by the hives. Why don't I go out here and take the top off and look at them again today and reach and pull a frame? And that one time I went out there just in jacket or in a, a shirt and shorts, and I took the top off. The bees said, oh, no, we're hungry. Go away. And I didn't go away fast enough, so I got popped a few times. My wife ended up going over to put the lid back on. She got popped. <laughs> oh, and uh, I, I I have been stung so many times, I mean, multiple times in double digits, sometimes working with bees. And you just you just get to the point that you deal with it. Well, and, and I like I said, I have a, a horrific story. Uh, um, I, I'll have to share it with the listeners, but 
at this moment, it, I, I'll just give you the, the nuts and bolts. It, basically, I got stung and ended up in the emergency room. And I, like I said, I'll, <laughs> oh, it was a nightmare, nightmare scenario. But there are more details to the story that, that, we, that I'll share right now because it would cover an entire show. But um, so you've gotten into <laughs> bees and you've gotten it. So you've gotten into bees and you've gotten into honey. And then you're doing the, the, the eggs, the pasture uh, raised uh, hens that are laying. And then you're also doing uh, produce and you're doing vegetables. I mean, you and I have talked, uh, basically talked shop when we were at the farmer's market. But so, okay, how are you and your wife doing all these different things and you're working a full-time job? It's, uh, I I work. I mean, pretty much I I work. uh, Like right now, this evening is a a rare evening for me to, to come out to a restaurant. When we wrap up, I'll go in and join the crowd there, but. That, that's a hint for me to wrap it up. Is that I, what I, you're saying? <laughs> no, not at, not at all, because I actually enjoy this. I enjoy sharing. I work a lot. You know, it's I, I, I work at work. I come home, I work. I work weekends, and I did the farmer's market from the first weekend of June until the end of September, and I only missed one weekend, and that was because I had to go to France on business. Wow. You know, I, I enjoy wow. working. It's, it's in my blood, but I, as I get older, I find out it's a little tougher and you don't recover quite as quickly. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the retirement coming up in March and then being able to put all of my energy and more focused energy in the farm because you know as well as I do, you, you have to take care when you're growing produce. You have to have the right water. You have to keep them weeded. And as you and I talked about the, the insects and things you have to deal with, and and I know you do as we do, trying to go as natural as possible. Right. So you're giving your customers the best possible product you can, staying away from the pesticides and all. It, it's a battle, but I, I just put in a lot of hours, a whole lot of hours. And uh, we do, I, I buy a lot of plants locally. I buy seed, and I think you start more with seed and go from it. I do. But this year, this past year, I, I bought a, a truckload of of plants from Woodmont High School's agricultural program here in the upstate. And I'm working with their ag teacher again this year in January. I'll place a large order with them. So it gives me an opportunity to work with ag students to have them to grow vegetables. That's not just going in somebody's garden to put dinner on their table, but to grow a lot that we will plant on our farm and be able to provide for a larger community. Oh, that's awesome. Through the farmer's market. Or, yeah, or, or through the direct sales. And, and I've even, uh, one of their students, I'm, I'm friends with her mom on Facebook, she's never been on a tractor. She's on the ag program. We had her come out to the farm about, probably about three weeks ago now, maybe four weeks ago. And I taught her how to drive a tractor and then taught her how to bush hog and taught her how to plow. And, you know, she bush hogged a small field for me and then learned how to plow it and you know, she's, uh, I believe, a 15-year-old young lady who's never been on a tractor. Wow. And she's in her ag program now. She has the experience. So I want, I want to be able to give back a little bit. You know, as we get a little bit from the community, we try to give back a little bit. But we try to provide really good quality produce. And, and uh, I've, I've got to focus more on the, the colder weather things as, as well as the warm weather because you don't have near the problems with the insects in the cold weather as we do in the warm weather. No, I totally agree. That's that's exactly right. And that's amazing that you're working with Woodmont High School. The, the twist of fate is my son actually went to Woodmont for about two years as part of their baccalaureate program. He, he eventually ended up at Hillcrest High School, but that that's an amazing thing that they – a lot of high schools are doing that, and I see where local farmers could participate and actually encourage young, upcoming farmers to be about – not only educating them about what they're doing, but educating them about the process of growing local, fresh, non-GMO. I mean, a lot of there's a whole argument out there about that. But just growing produce that you know where it's coming from and you know it how it was grown from the seed all the way to the, the final harvest. Exactly. It's like all all of the I would all of the cucumbers we sold this year at the market. And I would say probably 90% of the squash that we sold at the market, every one of the peppers we sold at the market were all a product that was, was started at Woodmont High School in their 
greenhouse there, and they have a greenhouse I'm jealous of. Yeah, it is massive. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've, I've but, been there. Yeah, it's right yeah. there on the backside of the stadium. It's it's huge. <laughs> but but we, we're, we're buying from them. You know, it supports their program. It helps with uh, agricultural education, and it helps us too. I'm getting good quality that I'm able to put out in the garden and, and know where it came from as well. So I'm I'm pleased I'm pleased to do that. No, that's great. I have a special affinity to to taking a seed and watching it sprout. So I'm a little different mindset. Although I love transplants, don't get me wrong. I love transplants that are yeah. already there, and you just drop them in the ground. Now, you you have a lot of stuff going on at your farm, and I know our listeners are intrigued and they want to know, hey, how can I be a part of Cedar Falls Farm? Is there anything you have for the listeners out there? Right now, all we really have going on is available at the farm. We have eggs year-round, which will really start to drop off soon, but we sell direct, drive out to the farm in the Fort Shoals community. We have eggs available. It's on our front porch. There's a beverage cooler out there. It it holds probably 28 dozen eggs at any given time, and uh, prices are marked. We work on the honor system. That's something we believe in in the farm community is is you know, treating people with respect and uh, until they prove us wrong and trust, trust is important, but there's a box out there. You can come and get eggs. And if you listen to this podcast and you hear about Cedar Falls farm, you want to come out and get some eggs. You can take 50 cent off a dozen, just put on their podcast. I've got a sign up sheet. You can put your name, write podcast beside it and take 50 cent off the price this mark. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I got a feeling some people are going to take advantage of that. That is great. Now, let me let me dive into a little deeper question with, with you, Mark. And are, are there one or two things that you've learned about life? Um, obviously, you're transitioning to a different part of your life. It's probably going to be more intense than you, than you thought. But are there one or two lessons from life, maybe as a hardship or a challenge, or maybe something positive that you'd like to share with some of the folks out there? Well, one thing in particular is don't take everything so serious. None of us are getting out of this alive. <laughs> and, you know, enjoy your enjoy yourselves along the way. Make sure that you take time to stop and smell the roses and take time for family and friends. I've lived a busy life, but I've always tried to carve out that time. It doesn't matter how successful you are in life. You really need to take time to take advantage of those moments, to be with family and friends when you can, and let people know when you love them, tell them you love them, respect each other, and just try to make the world a better place, you know, for being in it. It's uh, it's not about what you leave with. It's what you leave behind, you know, and and that's what I want to focus on is, is making sure that, I do something that helps impact people, and and when that day comes that I'm called home, people know who Mark Jones was, and they know that he made a difference. Because it's it's not about having your name on buildings and all, as far as I'm concerned. It's about the people local and people close to you. Try to touch lives and make a difference in people's lives. Wow, that is that is well said, Mark. And and I want to thank you personally for taking the time out and sharing a little bit about you, sharing a little bit about Cedar Falls Farm with us today i know the listeners are are grateful just having listened to you i'm sure we're going to have you on but again thank you thank you so much for spending some time with us absolutely it was my pleasure and and look forward to seeing you again as well as well my friend well be sure to check them out online and share this episode with everybody you know your support as a listener is key and most importantly support your local farms and farmers until the next time my name is Stefan, and you've been listening to the Farmer's Market Podcast. Keep it fresh, keep it local. If you haven't already, subscribe on iTunes. And while you're there, please leave us a rating and review.